This is your host, T. This is your host, Tia. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Top 10. Why? Geek Vibes Nation. Geek Vibes Nation. 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 The Top 10. The Top 10. They just hate us, Brittany. <laughs> All right. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back to an amazing episode of the Top 10 for Geek Vibes Nation. As always, I'm your host, Tia, and I have with me this morning the amazing Brittany. How you doing? I'm good. I'm, I am realizing I have a great lack of cats in my initial area right now <laughs> which is so different than normal normal like the moment i lay down here to like do the podcast they're like dude you're trapped great wonderful <laughs> where are they why are they not attacking you this morning uh, probably because they realized they had hard food and realized they didn't need me <laughs> <laughs> i have lady by my side my dog as always she is my shadow that should honestly be her like nickname the shadow because <laughs> wherever i walk she walks <laughs> i know when i watched you do that podcast live i was like oh look there's a lady and also those people on twitter that wanted to steal your dog I saw that. I was like, you you stay away from my dog. Lady Gaga just de- dealt with something. I ain't dealing with the same shit. Oh, my God. Okay, when people talked about really quick, I know, like, this right at the beginning of the podcast. When I heard about Lady Gaga getting her dogs kidnapped, I was like, that's crazy. Then when I found out her dog sitter got shot and the dog sitter, I was like, oh, the story. I, be- I believe her dog sitter got shot, like, four times in the chest. What I. The- Fuck. I think they're still alive because it didn't say that they were killed. They and I'm they like, went, they went to the hospital for non-life-threatening injuries. It said, "How is a bullet wound a non-life-threatening injury?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I, I'm glad that they're okay and that they'll make a recovery. Um, I obviously don't know Lady Gaga personally, but I hope that she compensates this person very well. Um, That's just insane. I heard that Lady Gaga got her dogs back, and I'm very happy about that because I'm telling you, as a dog owner, I would be broken if anything happened. She offered a $500,000 reward. I saw that. What they said that a lady returned them, and she said that she just found them by themselves, which they're always just like, Oh, are they involved? But it just seemed like it was like a nice older lady that just found them and was like, oh, I think these might be your dogs. So if she turns out, I hope she's the one that gets the money. Uh, hopefully, but you never know. But, uh, God, yeah, no, that's that's just insane to me. It's like, why? You know, why? The, the Arkansas in me wants to believe her, but I feel like the New Yorker in you is like, I don't trust this bitch. No, no, she just randomly happened upon these dogs. Nope, don't trust it at all. Don't trust it at all. But uh, <laughs> you know how that's, it is. That's Sorry, like what but... I was talking to the guy from New York City, and I was like, yeah, it's a whole other world there. My friend, Tia, I said, she's like, dude, do you want to get your phone stolen? You better get that shit out of your back pocket. <laughs> and he just started laughing. He was like, he's like, yeah. He's like, you'll trust a little too much around here. That's what, you know, honestly, that's exactly what I told Brittany the first time she came here in New York. Because, like, I'm not trying to call Brittany out, right? But, you know, Brittany's got these small little pockets in her in her jeans and this big-ass phone. Because she's always, for, I feel like as long as I've known Brittany, she's always had these, like, big, big phones. So she got this big phone that barely fits in the pocket, all sticking out, and it's literally like, steal me, steal me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, this is why I tell you you need to wear a, a purse or a backpack or something. You know what? That's what we're going to get you. Next time you come to New York, we're going to get you a little backpack. You can put your oh. phone in your backpack. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm a satchel. Those are the best kind of purses because I just – I have this thing that I'm so forgetful that if I have a purse and I take it off to eat, I'm going to forget it on the, like, on the chair. 
Oh, wow, no. To me, um, my purse is like an extension of me. I never forget it's always on, and I don't put it on the chair because, again, that's just asking people who are walking by to come stick their hands in your fucking, you know, purse. So I put it, like, right next to my seat, on my lap, on the table. I don't give a shit. Um <laughs> It's like, I feel like guys have it so convenient with, like, a wallet. Your life is right there. Your pockets are big enough. You can shove your phone in there. I don't want to have to carry a whole, like, luggage with me everywhere I go just to be able to be like, yeah, I have my phone and my wallet. I just would rather have jeans big enough that I could stick those in there. Like, if I could carry a wallet, like, my mama, she always carried a wallet because she didn't like purses either. I don't have, like, one of those big, big purses, but I definitely have, like, you know, a purse. You have something. My purse is always heavy as shit. That's what people have always told me. They're always like, oh, my God, what the hell do you put in here? It feels like you have a ton of bricks. And it's like, I just got a lot of shit. (laughs) You know what? (laughs) It's my weapon in case anyone tries to attack me. Just hit them with the purse. (laughs) on a TikTok where this lady was like, well, you know what purses are for? <laughs> Stealing glasses at restaurants. There's a whole part oh, of TikTok yeah. that's talking about like, oh, I stole all these glasses. I'm like, I never stole anything from a restaurant. I had a, my Ansley's brother growing up had such a thing from like, whether it was forks or like a glass, he just wanted to see what the biggest thing he could smuggle out without getting in trouble. And I think it was like a whole ass like chip bowl from like, like the Mexican <laughs> restaurant I took you from. I was like, golly, you think a little bastard. So I was never a kleptomaniac, but I remember there was one time where this was years ago, right? Like, holy shit, I'm 30. (laughs) And this is probably when I turned 21. So we went, so me and a friend of mine, we went to Outback, right? Because when you, all right, first of all, when you, huh? I just said, oh no. So when you like turn 21, you don't, for some reason, like really go to like bar bars, you go to like places like Fridays and frickin' outback that charge you an astronomical amount of money for like drinks that have barely any alcohol in them so this is at the time where freaking outback for some reason changed from like their normal glasses to like mason jars for everything with a handle i don't know why i remember that because i think it was like I used to get, say, like, their sangrias that would come in actual sangria glasses, and then suddenly we started going there, and they're, like, in mason jars and handles. I say this because the first time I went with this one specific friend, we're, like, there, we're drinking at the table, and we finish our drinks, and she was like, these are really nice glasses. I'm like, yeah, it's really cool that they, like, put them in mason jars. She was like, put them in your purse. And I was like, what? And she was like, (laughs) she was like, put them in your purse. And I was like, we can't do that. They're going to come back, and they're going to realize that the two drinks that we were drinking out are no more on the table. And she was just like, oh, Tia. And she, like, literally grabbed them and put them in her purse. And I was just like, I can't. you too wild for me. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of, like, uh, the of someone we know that has, like, that had those tendencies, but <laughs> not for restaurants. Oh, my God. I will say, um, like, and this is not me on air trying to make myself look good. Like, oh, she didn't. T-. No, I'm I'm a wuss. Like, I never took shit, you know, uh, just because I was, like, afraid of the consequences. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but I had friends. Did you what? I had friends, though. I knew people back in high school who would literally go into Hot Topic with a backpack, come out, that backpack being full and not having paid one cent for anything that was in that backpack. Like, and they could do, I had an ex that would go into Barnes and Nobles and come yeah, out with like five. That's the best story I was thinking of. <laughs> he would come out of Barnes and Nobles with five books just because he stuck them all in his pants and shit. And I'm like, I don't understand like how, like, I'm not trying to be a goody two shoes here, but (laughs) I was like, I don't feel like getting the cops call because I couldn't pay the $14 for some fucking book at Barnes and Nobles. (laughs) Growing up, it's like all my friends were the type that were like, oh, test your luck, test your luck, you know, go do this. And what's funny is when it would always go south, their parents would ream them ream them grounded no phone you know not you're not going to exist for the next month and my parents are like are you alive 
yes. Okay, you're good. Because I think they knew. I was always so careful, and also they were so wild in the 80s. They're kind of like, as long as you're not doing what we did, you're fine. (laughs) Oh, that was really funny. I have a cousin whose parents, like her mom and her stepdad and her dad, are like the epitome of like partied a lot in the 80s. And they used to be like, you know, oh, fucking people are like back when I was, you know, first turning 21 and shit it's like oh yeah you kids go out and you party till you know four in the morning you gotta sleep till like three in the afternoon we used to go to the bar party until 4 a.m go get breakfast and then be on time for our fucking day job to go to the whole you know do the whole thing take a nap afterwards and then go and do it all again or they'd be like oh you kids want to drink you want to smoke then you're gonna drink then you're not gonna drink your fruity little cocktails you're gonna drink fucking jack daniels not gonna smoke your little menthol cigarettes you're gonna drink our black cigarettes and everything like they would be there and like oh you want to do all this well you're gonna do it on our freaking terms like let's see how how you could stack up and it's like you know gen x is a scary generation (laughs) my mom like whenever she tells like stories i'll be like sitting there and i'm like is that before after you had my older brother because you know mom because you know 80s being a different time she got married when she was 16 so most of this wild crazy shit had to be from like 12 to like 15 16 my mom always tells me she was like um uh, you know like as i got older right i'd be like 25 26 and it'd be a work day and my mom's like oh, are you going out and it's like no and she's like at your age i was out at like 11 at night until like three four five in the morning and it's like mom it's a thursday and she's like so <laughs> <laughs> That's my dad like you know i the, you know how we have sonics and stuff and i was looking at this old building i said dad i said did that used to be like an old ass song? He said, "Yeah." He goes, "But never, nobody ever actually stopped at eight there." He's like, "We would stop there, get food, go instantly by the river, and then we would party and get drunk and eat our Sonic, and you'd make out, and then you'd go home." And I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dad." They they just built our parents differently, but um. <laughs> That is uh that is not the topic of today's top ten, although it is funny. Um but our top ten this week is the top ten good characters in bad movies. Cause sometimes you got a movie, right? And there's the one actor that you may like that's, you know, being solid, playing a good role, you you like the character, but overall the movie is not very good. Uh, And I feel like this happens to us a lot because, especially for me, you know, once I start liking an actor, I'm like, I want to see their whole library of films. And especially when actors are, say, first coming up, they just take roles, you know, where they can. So them, they're doing a good job because they're solid. But the movie is like, whoo. That's a bad movie. So I thought this would be a fun top ten for us to do. I'm super excited about it. Um, Before I go to you, Brittany, you know, we always got to give a shout out to our friends over at Stranger Damies. I think they just started their new campaign. Um, They're a D&D podcast, so you can check them out at Stranger Damies on Twitter and Instagram. They're run by Anthony, Dan, and Mark, three really awesome guys who also run They Call This a Movie, one of my favorite podcasts that I listen to pretty much on a weekly basis. So make sure you check them out. They're really awesome. I believe they just did a collab with this other podcast, Hop uh, Hop Nation USA, which is a beer podcast. It's just all sorts of awesome. So make sure you check them out if you like D and D. If you like all that awesome stuff, you know, if you love 80s references, you love adventure, did you like Stranger Things? If you do, you're going to love Stranger Damies. So make sure you check them out at Twitter and Instagram at Stranger Damies. But, Brittany, let's get into this. For number 10, what do you got for us? I will say right before that, I feel so bad for Dan because I can't pronounce his last name. And I'm always like, how do you say your last name again? He has- Spell it out for me. Sorry, Dan. I'm it's so a, sorry. It's Aquino. 
It's so easy. Dude, I'm from New York. I don't see last names like that all the time. They're from Jersey. I know I just called them out, but the, the, we've talked about it. They're from Jersey. They ain't even from New York. It's close enough. Basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can feel your eyes on me. <laughs> You're like, I'm laughing, but I'll kill you. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and start out strong. I'm going to go in with uh, Sloan from Into the Ashes. Oh, that's a good one. I was looking at that before. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, you know, the movie itself has a good setup. It's about a guy who, you know, basically, I'm going to reorganize it a little bit. He was a part of basically this crime group. There was, like, three of them, Sloan, uh, Charlie, I think, and I can't remember what this guy's name, the main character's name. That's how forgettable, forgettable it is, about how when the main dude went to prison, he ran off with all the money and basically went and started a new life. He ended up marrying the daughter of, like, the local sheriff. Uh, and the sheriff never really trusted him. But, you know, he just, like, has a new life. It's very, like, a like a little nowhere town with a lot of forests, you know, a lot of hunting, one of those kind of towns, right? And, well, Sloan gets out of prison, and he wants to know where his family member, you know, quote, unquote, because it's very much like a family. And so he, even like, he has a guy that's like, can find information, you know, the dude wants more money, he's like, no, stabs his hand, gets the information, goes track down this guy. Well, this all sounds like a good setup, until it's not a good setup. Because Sloan ends up murdering this dude's wife. And at first I was like, oh, my God, they went there. And so the movie becomes like, oh, the good guy trying to track down the old, you know, boss of this place, like crime. Well, I don't want to say crime family because it's not like the mob, like, oh, don't go against the family. But it is don't go against the family. But suddenly it's really convoluted. I, there's a point where I can remember the beginning. It has a strong start, doesn't yes. it? Like where you're just sitting there and you're like, oh, no, this could be great. And then somewhere in there you go, what the fuck's going on? Because remember they started doing like, oh, go to the past, go to the present, go to the past, mm-hmm. go to the future. And you're like, what the fuck happened? Because there's at some point like it's like in the middle of it and suddenly they go to the very end with a sheriff like, you know, you know, he wants to know what happened, you know, during that time. And you don't really get that it's the future. You just think suddenly, like, he took a break from all the craziness of the movie to just, like, chill out by, like, a pond. Like, I don't know. But, like, Slow is great. Like, the scene where he's like, oh, I love pie. You know, you know, your wife made a great pie. And, you know, the body's just there in the floor. And, you know, oh, she was really nice, you know. And it's just, like... I, I know I'm explaining it weird. It's just Sloan was so good, and he's played by Frank Grillo, who always plays the best bad guy. I mean, he's, like, the top, like, foreign, you know, actor in, like, China or something like that, like, of making, like, the most money or, like, playing the biggest part. I can't remember what it was. But you have this great fucking villain. You have these great actors, because the actors themselves are great. Like, the main character's uh, best friend. But that dude abandoned his whole family, like, I gotta help a friend. And I'm like, dude, you have a wife and children. You better stay home with them. Well, he was bored with it, because, you know, he got married young, and he's uh, the ball and chain, you know. And he wants some adventure, but... I agree. Into the Ashes feels as if it's two movies being spliced together because, um, as you said, Frank Grill is always great. You know, he kind of plays a very similar person in every role that he's in, but it's solid. You like it, right? You're like, I know what I'm getting here. Um, And he does it really well. He's he's big. He's imposing. Um, he gets out of prison. You know that he's angry because his money's gone, his quote unquote family member's gone. Um, and he does these roles really well. And he does these scenes really well. Like, as you said, where he's going to the guy who he paid to get information. And when the guy starts, you know, trying to ask for more, you can tell that Sloan is just sitting there stewing and you can really feel that, you know, it's great. And the, and as you said, 
great villain. As you said, the movie started out solid. You got it. You understood the plot. You know, it was there. And then suddenly out of nowhere, as you said, it time skips. It's weird. The pacing's crazy. And Sloane's death, spoiler alert, um, fucking was so awful. It was like you have anticlimactic. So anticlimactic. You have this big villain who's really imposing. You think it's going to be this crazy showdown. In reality, it's a car chase where Sloane's car pretty much flips off screen, I might add. And then you just kind of see the main character like look at the car and you're so and it's like, oh, okay, he's dead. And it's like, that's it. That's how he was killed. That that's the climax to that whole thing. It's get out of the car that he he looks fine. And then he's just like, it looks like that moment, you know, like in movies where they look away and they look back and there's like the X over the eyes. Like the yeah. thong, like, <laughs> 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 I was just positive what happened because I remember going, oh, he's dead? But he looks fine. I think he almost laughs at the main character like, yeah, it looks like you didn't kill me. You know, like, it looks like you didn't get your revenge. I'm already dead. And I'm like, dude, you look fine. You look like there's you, nothing wrong you look with great. you. <laughs> um, no, it really, it just felt as, <laughs> tell me that it didn't feel like the filmmaker gave up halfway through the film. <laughs> The guy that was like this going great, but you know what would make it even better if we went further beyond, if we went M. Night Shyamalan over uh, here. <laughs> I'm really trying to make it twisty. What a twist. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, 100%, I agree. Um, Brittany and I were really excited for this movie because we are both Frank Grillo stands. Um, and whenever we see that Frank Grillo is going to be in a new project, we usually watch it villain like there's a there, there's a few actors that i sit there and i'm like oh you know if they're gonna play a character it's gonna be like hit or miss like maybe it'll be good maybe it'll be bad but frank Rilla always be, plays such a great villain whether it was like brock and like um oh civil war, not civil war uh winter soldier sorry so I, he cut out for just a second and i was like i don't know what she said but i bet it was winter soldier no i mean seriously it's like even if the movie isn't that great, you know he's gonna be good, right? Um, what you calls it? Like Big like Daddy. It, yeah, no, he's he's so good. He's so good. And even when he plays like a good guy, right? He plays this like really badass good guy. Like in the purge, he was technically supposed to be the good guy. Um, which is so funny. I was talking recently um on an episode of figure it out which is this episode i do with juan pete and this guy jd um for geek fives nation and we were talking about how like frank grillo practically played the punisher in the purge movies um and he was great in that so it's like he's really good by the way anyone who um oh god what is the movie called oh yeah anyone who has netflix check out wheel man it's on Netflix. It no, has Frank. To bring that up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead then. I apologize. No, no, no. I was just saying, like, I'm glad you're on the same thought. You go ahead. No, I mean, so if you have Netflix, watch Wheelman. Frank Grill is in it, and it's a really interesting movie because it takes place. 99% of the movie is just Frank Grillo in a car, but he plays um, kind of similar to, like, say, what Jason Stahem played in the transporter like that's he's a transporter right but it you know obviously things go awry and i'm not going to go through the whole plot of it but that is a fantastic movie and considering it's all done within like the car um it just continuously is really enjoyable and the only time it say is out of the car is really like the last second of the film so i definitely suggest that if you are like us and you're a frank grillo fan but yeah i agree sloan from into the ashes um great character bad movie <laughs> so bad movie. i'm gonna go with number nine and i'm going to i don't know if this is like coming out swinging or coming out not swinging because the movie was pretty bad um <laughs> but i'm just writing it down i always have to do this thing where it's like wait my thoughts my thought process um the character is michael played by joel kinnaman in the movie brothers by blood um, and so this movie probably like came and went, uh, under anyone's radar. It just came out like 
a freaking month or so ago. But the whole thing is that it really quick, you have these two cousins, Michael, and then you have this other cousin that I forgot his fucking name. But the whole Here's like that doesn't matter. Yeah, the whole thing is these two cousins in Philadelphia and mobster, blah, 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 and all that. And Michael is played by Joel Kinnaman again, is pretty much this like unhinged guy. Um, he, he's the epitome of when you have him on screen, you just feel tense because he's so unpredictable. Like there's this one scene in the movie that, um, Apparently, Michael, like, bought a racehorse, but the horse, I think, got injured, and pretty much they're like, we have to put the horse down. But Michael's pissed because he spent a lot of fucking money on this horse, and he's pissed at – and so they're in the stable, right? And he's pissed at the guy who is in charge of the horses, and they're pretty much like, you know, this horse is never going to run again. You know, you might as well put him down and blah, 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 and at first – uh, Michael was literally going to shoot the fucking horse, and they're like, no, let's do this humanely. So they come, and they bring the the injection, and Michael just is like, well, it's my horse. I should do it. And he takes the needle, and he has the cap off, and he's like, what would this do to, like, a person? And they're like, Michael, like, that's really lethal. Like, even a prick will freaking, like, kill someone. And he's just, like, waving it around so menacingly, you know, and you don't know if he's literally going to freaking kill someone and it's kind of one of those things he's and where he laughs afterwards and he's just like oh come on like you think i was gonna do that like what no no yes. yeah, like you're kind of a bad guy i think you would do it yeah or and then after he has the vet like inject the horse michael then is like you know what no i actually do want to pay for the like surgery that will save the horse and they're like michael we just injected the freaking thing and he's just like like just this whole like power play tension thing that's really done very well by joel kinnaman you know i love him i think that he's a great actor um and i think that he does a good job sometimes playing the good guy sometimes playing the bad guy and i think that he played this character really perfectly because anytime he was on screen you really felt like shit um Things are not going to be good. But besides that, the rest of the movie was just so boring. Really, that's what it is. It didn't feel like there was really any sort of plot. And I watched it with Paulie, and we both had that same thing where, you know, when, like, you're thinking it, but you don't know if it's true, and then the other person is also thinks it. It's like it literally felt like there was no plot to the movie. It wasn't going anywhere. It was very boring. Um, the main character that they focused on, as opposed to focusing on Michael, was the other cousin, who is this very, like, soft-spoken, barely-speak sort of guy who, you know, just walks around Philadelphia sullen in deep thoughts because well, that's such a trope. Guy, the main character. What'd you say? Why don't they always make the boring guy the main character? I have no idea. Um, It just felt really boring, and there was at one point... (laughs) You know what also made it, like, really terrible? There's that one point where the main character gets with this girl in it, and they have a sex scene, and I swear to God, it's the most boring, bland, slow sex scene you've ever seen in a movie where I'm like... I feel bad for these two actors. Like, that's so uncomfortable. Um, And then the ending of the movie was so anticlimactic because the whole thing on top of this, right, is that there's, like, the typical Philadelphia power play, the Irish versus the Italians, which is done in pretty much any movie that has to do with gangsters and has to do with Philadelphia. So it's, like, but it's so half-assed because you never really see this coming to, like, fruition, Right. You are assuming like, oh, well, so Michael is like the Irish and then they're going up against the Italian. But you really it's just not there. You just don't feel that. And so at the very end of the movie, again, spoiler alert, so I doubt like anyone's really going to care. At the end of the movie, it's like Michael is sitting there with one of his like, I guess, lackeys. And the main character, his cousin, is literally sitting there, and they're all sitting in this, like, room as, like, Michael and the other guy are, like, loading their guns because they're getting prepared to go to war with the Italians. 
And then literally as Michael's like talking about like everything that they need to do in order to like, you know, do their thing. The cousin stands up and shoots both the guy and Michael to death and then walks out of the room. And that's the end of the movie. Like, what? Like, you're about to go to war. That's not going to stop the Italians. Like, are you saying, like, oh, we're going to work together now? Or maybe I just stop the war? Like, what are you trying to say? Well, his whole thing, the whole movie was people telling him, like, you know, you got to get away from Michael. Michael's insane. He's not, he only makes problems. Like, this whole thing with the Italians wasn't needed, you know? it. You didn't need to do, like, he's just... A bad person and you need to get away from him and he needs to be stopped but you know you just leaving philadelphia won't stop him like he needs to be taken out pretty much because there's at some point where the italians even say to him like because the guy's like we don't want any trouble like and the italians are like well then michael has to be out of the picture because he's the troubled one but you don't know if he's doing that because of that because that happened all the way in the beginning of the movie and it's like it really never came back up it just seems like he was so tired of michael's antics because literally like michael um you know he like one of one of the good friends of the main character like ends up killing himself because of something michael does right so the whole thing is that pretty much the guys like I feel trapped by Michael. And also there's like the alluding to, but they never really confirm it, but it's the alluding to that Michael's father killed the main guy's father. Um, even though like they're, they were brothers. So I don't fucking know. They're brothers, right? Well, What's I, the name of the movie again? Brothers by Blood. Is that where the title is referring to? Yeah, I don't know, because Michael and the other guy aren't brothers, they're cousins, so I don't understand the whole thing at all, and then there's, like, this weird subplot that, like, the main character's sister died from a hit-and-run accident when he was younger, so that shit plagues him all the time. I don't know, the movie's just boring. It was, like, one of those movies that when you're watching it, because I was given advanced screeners of it, so I wanted to do a review of it. But it's one of those things where the movie is so boring and long that you keep checking how much time you have left. And I feel like if you have to check how much time you have left, then you're not really making a movie. (laughs) So... That's my number nine. Again, I think Joel Kinnaman eats the scenery in this, and I think that it was a really unique character for him to play, this sort of very vile um, bad guy, because I think he plays it well. Like, listen, he plays good guys, too. It's not like Frank Grillo, where maybe he only plays bad guys. But when he plays bad guys, I think he's really good at it. And I think that Joel Kinnaman has this thing where he just, He's in movie because not everyone recognizes him as like a great actor. And I think it's because he just picks these movies that he thinks are going to be good, but they don't end up being good. But he's good in them, if that makes sense. It's like I think he picks these movies that probably have a lot of um, potential to them, such as like Suicide Squad or RoboCop. It's like they have a lot of like great potential in them to like be big. And it's like, he's doing his job just fine. It's just the rest of the movie ain't doing its job. Now, was this, like, was this movie, like, an actual movie movie? Or is it one of those things where, like, the actors do pro bono work like the lawyers do? (laughs) I think it was an actual, like, movie movie. I mean, the production value isn't really bad. I mean, you could tell that there wasn't, like, a huge budget. But it's not, say, a – it was, like, an indie studio that did it. Um, and it, it went straight to like, you know, video on demand and all that, but I don't, it, I don't know. Maybe it was a pro bono work. (laughs) John Bernthal's done a few. Yeah, but I think, but I, I'm trying to think, I'm not sure that I've ever disliked any of those sort of films that John Bernthal's been in. I love Pilgrimage. I love Sweet Virginia. Pilgrimage was Um, good. So I'm not sure, but yeah, so Michael and Brothers by Brothers by Blood, God, I don't know why that felt like a tongue twister to me, but yeah, that's my number nine. Brittany, what's your number eight? I'm probably going to go with, I, I'm trying to keep it going strong, and I may like start to run in a weird, uh, like, into a wall in a little while, but I'm going to go ahead and go with Wonder Woman and Justice League. In in the 2017 Justice League. Yes, the bad yeah. one. 
<laughs> okay, great. I thought for a second you said Injustice, because isn't there, like, a cartoon movie like that? Yeah, there's also a game. It's, like, where, like, basically if Superman went off the deep end type of, like, if he was a murderous uh, mofo. Uh, but I, the reason why is because I remember, and this is kind of like the, the weird stance on it, when we were watching Justice League and falling asleep on the couch because it was so bad, right? Mm-hmm. And there's few movies that have done that to me. You know how you said, oh, you know, you know a movie's bad when you're constantly looking at the time to see how much time is left to the movie? Yeah. <laughs> I think her shut out. And I feel that because there's like this whole stand culture. And, and I don't understand why DC like cultivates it more than anyone where it's like it is like the if you're not with us you're against us kind of mentality don't get me wrong i love dc but those movies are so bad and i think it's because they rushed it so bad to like catch up with marvel that marvel had all this time to like fully like flesh out like the path that they wanted to take and planned all these movies ahead but these just seem like oh we just kind of smushed them together but i will say when Wonder Woman popped up, I was like, oh, God, she's beautiful. Like, she's actually interesting. She's not campy. She's normal, Tia. She's normal. Because that's, like, my big hiccup. It's like Superman is good, right? And Aquaman is good, but he's campy. And right. also, I think that's when Superman had his, like, whole mustache situation going oh, on. Man. If I'm Yeah. And then Batman, like, then Affleck did not play a good Batman. I'm so sorry, um, Joanne. <laughs> no, he I'm didn't. Sorry. Like, I'm sorry. This whole, like, delusion that, you know, Bat- like, Ben Affleck's going to come back as Batman. I don't know. All right. I'm sorry to go on a tangent because I know this is about Wonder Woman. But no, I don't know. You know, we had for, like, the past four years hearing about release the Snyder Cut, and so now they're going to give you a Snyder Cut, which, by the way, Zack Snyder himself said that even though the film's four hours long, he left it on a cliffhanger. You had the time to to film an actual decent ending because you know that there's not going to be another one after this. It's like you were given the money to freaking film additional scenes, and you can't film a decent freaking ending. You're going to leave it on a cliffhanger for people. And now this whole hashtag of restore the Snyderverse. There is no restoring the Snyderverse. They just announced that they're going to reboot Superman. They have a new Batman with uh, Robert Pattinson. In what world? In what world are they restoring the Snyder first? But anyway, I'm sorry. That was a tangent. Go on. That like got everybody to love him so much. Like, what movie is the reason like why people have a cult following of him? I have no idea. Is it 300? Like 300 was a good movie, but I wouldn't say that it's so spectacular that we have to make a god out of this man. And that's how it feels like. It's like I I saw some people online going, "Wow, he is like the best grifter." That they've ever seen. Like he just gets Warner Brothers to keep giving him money because he knows that by saying that there's a cliffhanger in his movie that people are going to ask for a second one. And Warner Brothers may bend to it. <laughs> I just still, I got also one thing I'm trying to get like why because people was like oh Zack Snyder Zack Snyder and they're really like obsessed with him more than really the DC universe itself. Like, I bet if Zack Snyder was like, I got this other project, you know, people would be obsessed. But I just, I, that's what I don't get. But I will say, so, you know, Ben Affleck's Batman I didn't like because I felt like he was, like, very, like, <sighs> he was the version of Batman when they're like, Mom, I want Batman. It's like, we have Batman at home type of situation. And Wait, I it's- I'm sorry again to interrupt you. I'm so sorry that I'm doing at this one. Um, when they announced that Ben Affleck was going to be Batman, there was this like amazing meme. And I guess at some Oscar award, it was like Christian Bale sitting down at the table and Ben Affleck, like, you know, standing over, like talking to him. And someone put like, you know, text bubbles. And it was Ben Affleck going, you said anyone could be Batman. And Christian Bale going, not you, though. <laughs> Anyone but you. <laughs> like, it's like this, like showed us, like he could be a good actor, and we've enjoyed things we've been in. I just don't like him as Batman. I don't like the way he plays Batman. 
I don't either. Um, I used to very much dislike Batman. Batman to me was like Tom Cruise. If he was in something, I didn't want to see it. But then as I started watching more of his things, I, I like a lot of the movies that he's in. I loved Argo. <laughs> Not Ben Affleck, and that kind of cracked me up. Did I? I thought I said Ben Affleck. <laughs> Batman, like, I didn't care about Batman. I tried to avoid things he was in. And I was like, but Batman's cool. Oh, and my then, God, uh, Ben Affleck. Sorry, <laughs> shit. Shit. I try not to – it used to be where I was not watching things that Ben Affleck was in. But then I started realizing that he's a pre- – I like him. I liked Argo. I liked The Accountant. I loved Gone Girl. So it's like, all right, he can act. Um, I just – as you said, I just didn't like his Batman. Um, I don't know what it is if maybe he was pl- – I. I believe, and listen, this is not me, like, generalizing or anything like that, um, but I believe that he was filming his Batman scenes when he was having a lot of inner demons, and maybe that attributed to his performance. I don't know, Um, but I think that Ben Affleck wants to move on because I think that, you know, the fandom is really intense, and for someone who's trying to recover from what he had I don't think that that's good for his mental health and I think that he's even said that in the past before so um you know my my main shtick is like don't force the guy to do something that he doesn't want to do because it sounds sometimes from these like you know stands that they don't care if he doesn't want to play the part anymore they just want him to play the part when it's like I don't know if the part is even good for him yeah, I think sometimes it's like it just doesn't match, and that's why it's like, I think Wonder Woman was such like a breath of fresh air in that movie, because I was like, okay, she's strong, but they didn't make her like, you know, sometimes when they make a strong female character, they almost like make them super, super intense, like very in your face, like, yeah, I'm a powerful woman, and you're like, that's great, but you're kind of like, like being a little intense right now so i'm like glad that wonder woman could come across like in that very like like a regal intensity of what you would expect like an amazonian princess you know what i mean i i think gail godot is amazing um she has this way to her of being very strong and feeling very strong but feeling very warm and feeling compassionate which is like wonder woman's whole thing right she is a very strong person she's literally an amazon but she's also a compassionate person who is loving um and believes in humanity and i think that gail godot really uh, exemplifies that right and I loved her. Um, I loved her in Batman versus Superman. You know how much I hated Batman versus Superman. When she walked in, I was like, oh, my God. First of all, the dresses that she was in, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Um, and I think that she was really wonderful. I would argue that she's probably the best thing in any of the movies that she's in. Batman versus Superman, Justice League, Wonder Woman 1984. She's the best thing out of all of them. Uh, no I agree I, that's the like and Aquaman wasn't bad like I think the actor for him is great but I just I felt like he was very campy his Aquaman, movies were campy well Aquaman was better in actual Aquaman than I think he was yeah. in Justice League I, I do agree because in Justice League they tried to make everyone really intense right you had Batman who was really intense and brooding you had um, you know, Cyborg, who, you know, is really sullen and intense. You have, you know, Superman, very intense. Everyone's very intense. And then you have Aquaman going, oh, dressed like a bat. I dig it. You know, and it's like, it didn't feel like it matched at it all. It felt like a Chad. He felt like, <laughs> a, like a, a whole ass Chad. But I did like him in actual Aquaman. I don't know if you've seen that yet. Um, How sorry. long was it in someone else? Huh? Aquaman has someone else in it that you don't care for. I I fucking hate her. I'll say it on air. I don't like Amber Heard, and she needs to get and she needs to go. Um, she no. I I support people like that. (laughs) That's why I was like, speaking of Aquaman, let's get Tia worked up. You you know, like 
I'm just saying, I'm going to go on, I don't, no, I'm not going to go on my soapbox, but fuck Amber Heard. I don't give a shit. Like, I'll say it on air. But besides her, I ignored the fuck out of her and Aquaman. Um, Jason Momoa was great, and Nicole Kidman was great in it. Everyone else was great in that. Um, do, I, do I think it's the best DC movie? No, but visually it is pretty good. Um, there's one scene that's, like, towards the end that's, like, really visually beautiful. Um And the comic book accurate costume that they throw Aquaman in at the end is mm, chef's kiss. (laughs) Jeez. Sorry, I'm I'm dying over here. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, no, I totally agree. Wonder Woman and Justice League, definitely the best thing out of Justice League, which is a terrible movie. Pretty unwatchable, but Gail Godot just has this great natural ability to really command the screen, which I love. I do, too. I was going to say, I just think there's just something intense about her, but in a very, like, it's not even like, oh, the way she looks. It's like she just, I don't know, the air of her. No, exactly. Um, You know, I saw, <laughs> my uh, theory as to why I think she play, she's really good at playing this, like, badass, even though she's not that big, right? Like, yeah. physically, she's really not that muscular, but... I feel like maybe it's because she was in the military. It, like, kind of radiates off her. Right? Like, I don't know. She has just a look where I'm like, she looks like she knows what she's doing. And it's like, oh, because she does know what she's doing. (laughs) Um, But I love it. No, this is a great pick for number eight. I want to stick with the DC trend here of a, um, a good character in a bad movie. And the thing is that this movie came out last year, right? And people really loved her. They really hated it. I really wanted to like it. Um, But I I have no desire to rewatch it. And it's going to be Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn in Birds of Prey. Dude, I still haven't seen it. But I hear she's great. I really want to like Birds of Prey. I really did. Um, And I hate that people bash it so badly just for the simple fact that it's, like, a female team-up. Because, see, that's the thing that bothers me. It's, like, because that's where people's, like, takeaway from it is. Well, oh, look, it's a bunch of girls, you know? And it's, like, no, fuck you. You know? (laughs) It it can be – we're badass, you know? And all these – You had all these, like, actresses and these characters suddenly come in and you're, like – you have a character that's already fully established from others and you're like trying to catch up and it's like, Oh look, here's these characters. I know nothing about except for the comics in the original justice league show. It also didn't make sense because, um, Harley Quinn was never a part of the birds of prey. So realistically, it's like, why did we need this movie? Right. Um, so Margo Robbie as Harley Quinn is amazing, right? I could not think of a better casting for Harley Quinn. When I first saw the pictures of her for Suicide Squad and then I saw Suicide Squad, I was like, this is who I always wanted to see on screen as Harley Quinn. Even though I had no idea who the fuck Margo Robbie was at that point, I still was like, this is Harley Quinn. And she's done it yeah. beautifully. Um, and in Birds of Prey, she is Harley Quinn, and she's fucking amazing as it. I, I love her in it. She's certainly the standout. It should have literally, the movie just been called Harley Quinn. Um, yeah. But the movie itself, first of all, um, you could tell had, like, the less budget out of everything. Um, so you have Har- so this is why I didn't like the movie, right? You have Harley Quinn, and then she's fine. Um, I... And I like Ian McGregor as an actor. I hated what he did with Black Mask. Um, I hated what he did with Black Mask so badly. Um, Who? Ian McGregor. He's the guy who plays Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's what I thought you said. I didn't even realize that was him. Yeah, so you have Ian McGregor playing Black Mask. And I just thought that he played it kind of campy at times. It it just, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't like that the movie decided to go with this like Deadpool sort of um, style because Harley Quinn was uh, narrating it. She was breaking the fourth wall. Um, And the thing is, is that like, 
That's her thing, though. That doesn't work, though, in everything, right? Like, Deadpool can do it. But, like, her, I don't know. I just didn't, me personally, I didn't like her breaking the fourth wall to look at the camera or her narration or anything like that. I just, I don't know. I just didn't like that direction. Um, And to me, you know, Journey Smollett, who played Black Canary, was fine, even though she used her powers once in the film. And it's like, it was a pretty awesome. It, right <laughs> once it's one. like an Aries. right she uses it once and it's like and it was a pretty like awesome one when she did it so i'm like why didn't we see her more then you have um cassandra kane who's supposed to be like a badass little assassin and was reduced to like a pickpocketing girl with like a cast on her arm for some reason, that bothered me. I don't know why the cast on the arm bothered me. But I hate that she was, like, a, just a pickpocket person. I didn't like that at all. Rosie yeah. Rosie Perez was fine in her character, but I didn't understand why she was there. Um, she just didn't seem like she fit with everything. And then my biggest problem with this, which everyone, like, yelled at me when I said I disliked it from the trailers, was, um, I forget the actress's name, but the girl who played Huntress was so overacting, it was so cringe, and everyone's like, oh my god, she's... Like, very, like, was it just intense, or what? There's this one scene that was from the the trailer that I cringed at the trailer. And then when I watched the movie, I was like, yeah, it was no better in the movie. It's the scene where they are like going through this like portal to get, not like a real portal. I'm like just a tube, right? I called it a portal for some reason. They go through this tube to get into like this main area. Right. And in the tube, um, Huntress like kills the dude in it, which is like fine, whatever. Um, and they get out, and they're all kind of just, like, standing there awkwardly, and freaking, you know, Huntress is doing, like, the most, like, overacting huffing and puffing that you can ever see, and Black Canary goes, I love this girl, she has anger issues, and she, and Huntress goes, I don't have anger issues, and it's like, it just was so overacted and so cringy. And I was That's like, the, oh, God. It's like when you would, like, write stories in, like, middle school or high school and you had the very intense character who's very gruff and you. She's very angry and she's mad all the time. She snaps at any moment. <laughs> yeah, and, like, dude. And what's crazy is, like, I think it's because as, like, we move on, we get more realistic characters. And to put them, kind of, like, typecast them in that kind of, like, uh, they, uh, you're like um, okay it just reminded me of like how we acted back in our high school plays like standing around huffing and puffing she's mad so she's gonna you know pace a little and everything and it's like what the fuck is going on and so that makes sense because it's like oh you have to express that emotion but like when you're in a movie like watching it you can be like there's okay. a big difference between acting on stage and acting in a film, and apparently no one told her that. <laughs> um, what you call it? And the last thing I'll say is I hate the ending. Oh my god, the most anticlimactic fucking way to kill a villain in the worst CGI. Some of the worst CGI. Sorry. Henry Cavill's mustache disappearing was the worst CGI. Or Wonder Woman. Some of the worst CGI I've ever seen. It was so anti-climatic. I was like, wait, what? 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 (laughs) No, it wasn't. So they're facing off against, you know, Black Mask. Because the whole thing is like, you know, I don't even remember the whole fucking thing. And I don't care about the whole thing. Um, They're like, they're on a pier and Harley Quinn, they're having, like, this standoff and everything. Black Mask is threatening to, like, kill the little girl. And Harley Quinn just, like, f- does, like, this flip, grabs Black Mask's, like, in her legs, and then yeets him off of the freaking like, pier. And then she, like, put a bomb on him, and then he explodes. Dude, this one just remind me of bad fan fiction, like when you try to write out the fight scene, and you're like, and then she jumped on him, but little did he know, I planted a bomb on him, so you know, when he falls into the water, he's going to explode, and you're like, what? 
it was definitely written by as bad fan fiction because then it's like, oh, I, I can see it now. And then he exploded. And then afterwards, me and the girls went and got some margaritas because <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what happens in the freaking movie. <laughs> And they're like, well, you know, in Avengers, they got uh, shawarma, and it's like, yeah, but... It's just, it's just different. It's just different. You know, it's just different because if it had been done well, it would have been well, and it was not done well. I just really... I I have to be honest with myself. I tried to force myself to like Birds of Prey and say that it wasn't so bad and all that because I didn't want to like... Because, again, the people who... You know, a lot of people who hate it just literally hate it because they're like, oh, it's a bunch of girls. And I'm like, I don't want to perpetuate that because that's not how I feel at all about it. But I can't sit there and say that it was a good movie. But Margot Robbie's always solid as Harley Quinn. I loved her outfits in the movie. I loved her acting. There was nothing wrong with that. I love this one line. She's at the club, and this one guy's like, you dumb bitch. And she's like, don't call me dumb. I have a PhD, motherfucker. And I was like, that's yeah. true. <laughs> Dr. Harley. Dr. Harleen Quinzel. So, you know, I love that. So it's like she was great in it. Um, the only <laughs> the only thing that I got, I got like irrationally mad at it. Not mad, but I was just kind of like, is the director actually from New York? Because I don't think she is. Because the whole thing was that they made this really big deal that Harley Quinn wanted this bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich with hot sauce. And people are like, oh, my God, I feel seen. You know, the bacon, egg, and cheeses, you know, blah, blah, blah. The thing is, though, in New York, we put our bacon, egg, and cheeses on a roll. This bacon, egg, and cheese was on, like, a ciabatta bun. And I'm like... Mm, Kathy Ann, are you? Do you know New York? Because a bacon, egg, and cheese don't go on a ciabatta bun; it goes on a roll. So that was my one thing. But then you had all these people who like aren't from New York who were like discovering, like, oh my god, a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. That's so revolutionary. It's so good. Oh, have you seen this new trend? Did you start? And it's like, man, Becks have been a staple for freaking decades, and you guys are just I like the Becks. Back. And you guys are just acting as if, like, Kathy Yan invented – Kathy Yan, by the way, is the director. And it's like, you guys are acting as if Kathy Yan invented Bex, and I – you know, I can't. <laughs> we, I'll have you know, I rednecked it yesterday, and I put that shit in a hot dog bun because I didn't have anything else to put it in. Oh, my. <laughs> it was good, though. It was good. Don't come for me. Oh, my God. I have Paul in the background just going, yeah, who puts it on a Shibata bun? <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know why that was something I really just paid attention to because I was like, because in the film, right, you you have Harley Quinn, like, really, because she's hungover, right, which is a staple. You get hungover, you go get a Beck, right? And she's really hungover, and she goes to this bodega, and she's, like, you know, staring at it, and she's describing how it's made, and you're sitting there, and you're like, man, that looks freaking good. It's like a perfectly cooked egg. He's putting the cheese on. He's putting a little bit of hot sauce. It looks freaking good. And then they put it on a ciabatta bun, and I'm like, you lost me here. <laughs> that you goes on a roll. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Now, the next time I come to New York after everything, we have to go get one. And also, second, if you hear me making noises, I don't know why the cats are going full stupid today and deciding to, like, crawl into the blinds and, like, try to <laughs> rip up the carpet. So, if you hear me go, that's me trying to tell the cats, please fuck <laughs> off for five seconds, please. No, it's all good. But, yeah, so Harley Quinn, number seven, Birds of Prey, Brittany. What do you got for your number six? Let me see here. Let me, because I, I bet you had this like, were... lined up in the book. So let me see what else I had on my list. Let's see. By the way, I bet what? people who are listening are like, really, Tia, you're getting irrationally angry about a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. And it's like, here in New York, we take that shit seriously. <laughs> yeah. You guys... uh, I'm going to go with Max from The Residence. <laughs> Oh, my God. So I almost thought about putting the resident down, but then I was like, no, no, no. But then I was like, is Brittany going to get mad at me for this because she loves the resident? (laughs) Self is bad. Like, this is where it's like, where it's hard. The Mm -hmm. only reason I think it's good is because of Max and Juliet. 
But my thing is, so I'll go through it really quick. Basically, it's a movie about uh, there's Julia, who is an ER doctor, who uh, she has a breakup, and she's trying to find a new apartment to live in in New York City. She ends up finding this apartment. Like, she sees a flyer. Uh, it turns out to be, like, I think, like, wasn't it, like, 2800 a month? Like, something like that. Um, I think, like, the real thing was, like, 3000 a month, but at first she thought he said, like, 30000 a month or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so that inflation, though. Um, so she's like, oh, you know, he's fixing up this new apartment. Like, oh, it's going to be brand new inside because I'm refinishing everything. And give me a little bit, and it'll be fixed up. And she's like, oh, my God. And he's like, well, you see, there's a train that comes underneath, and it rattles the entire house. And she's like, okay, I get it, even though, like, that wouldn't matter. I think you said people in New York would be like, it's fucking New York. you got to expect that there's going to be something happening with noise. And so uh, – she well, no, my, my main thing is that that's like a draw, right? You live in New York. You want to live near the frickin' um, subway station so that you can get to work easier. And that makes apartments actually more expensive where I live, right? I live but near the pier. But I don't live, say, like, I live a few blocks up, right? But the people yeah, who live... a five-second walk. But the people who live in the apartment buildings literally right next to the train station are paying a hefty amount for the convenience of living right next to the train station that goes into Manhattan. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just no, no, clarifying. I, just, I loved it because uh, I think where your parents lived too, they had the, the subway station like right next to the train station. I always get confused if it's called subway or train. But um, I was going to say, so she sits there and goes, Okay, and keep in mind, this, like, free, it has, like, a full, like, giant living room. It has a full-on kitchen. It has a full-on bathroom with an old, like, Victorian-style porcelain tub. And then you have a full-ass bedroom. It even had a wine cabinet or wine, what was it called? Yeah, like- There's a new family of scratch-off games from the Ohio Lottery called Taxes Paid. If you like big payouts, this is your game. The $10 Taxes Paid Scratch-Off has a top price of half a million dollars. Prefer to keep it small and play for fun? This is your game. Taxes Paid Scratch-Off start at just $1. So pick your price, pick your prize, and play today. The Taxes Paid Family of Games, new from the Ohio Lottery. This is your game. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly. Like a wine cellar, wine cabinet, which was like really cool. Yeah. And the whole thing is, so she starts to, like, hit it off with her landlord, Max, and it's great. Uh, but she's really, she's still really attached to her boyfriend. But then it does, like, this flashback scene. You realize that Max is actually a uh, stalker who is super obsessed with her. He's planned all this from the beginning. That's why the rent's so cheap. That's why he redid the apartment so he could get into the apartment easily, you know, through the walls. Um, he he planned all this, the fire, yada, yada, yada. Basically, fast forward, he ends up uh, drugging her at night so he can do inappropriate things at night to her. And the whole setup is like, okay, you know, this is like a great scary movie. But then you start to realize a lot of this shit doesn't make sense. Like you said, like, uh, yeah, it would be way more expensive because of the convenience. And why is this apartment so cheap? And I get it's like, okay, because he's like really wants her there. But it becomes so unbelievable. You're like, how? And also, like, whenever she's, like, an ER doctor and she's oversleeping every day, like, severely late for her shift, I feel like that would not fly for a doctor. Like, I feel like that would make me want to freak out. And it keeps happening every day. And it's like they have such, like, intense schedules. I can't see them just being like, oh, and then whenever, like, she starts getting kind of drugged up, fucky feeling, she's like, oh, I'll do a blood test on myself. And then she starts, like, putting cameras in that. And it's, like, it's believable but not believable. But it's also, it has an age full because it's from the early 2000s. But then you also have the freaking fight scene at the end. He is so, <laughs> like, like, Tia knows. that. So she ends up, uh, Julia has a face-off with Max. Uh, and you keep thinking the fight's about to end. 
And then it just keeps going. It's like, oh, yeah, she finally pushed him, and he got hurt, and you're like, okay, that's the end. But then he got up, and he's after her again, and it's like, oh, but then she hurts him again. And you're like, okay, and this happens like three, four, five times (laughs) before the final, like, murderizing happens. So, yeah. I wanted to mention really quick, because you know how much I love the actor Lee Pace. Lee Pace plays uh, Juliet's boyfriend in this. Um, like uh, deaderized, he gets shoved in a closet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he like he he was definitely done dirty in this uh, situation. But um, what you calls it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things in the movie that when you look back at it, you're like, did it make sense? You know, the price yeah. of the apartment didn't make sense. The fact that she, I don't think you can just do blood work on yourself, right? Yeah. And also, she got those results, like, super quick, too, especially in the early, like, whatevers. It takes, like, a while, you know? Like, <laughs> blood work yeah, doesn't... Co- it still takes, like, a few days. But, like, yeah. back then, you'd have to wait, like, a week for something. Exactly, exactly. So it's, like, the fact that she got so quickly, um, the fact that, like, no one really was raising that much of a concern over any of this shit. Um, And then I think the thing that kind of takes me out of the residence so easily is, like, first of all, I do like Jeffrey Dean Morgan in this role. I like his chemistry with, um, what's her name? Is it Hilary Swank? I don't want to remember her name. I just know that she used to be, like, a big actor in the day. Like, not big, big, but, like... I think it's Hilary Swank. Um, yeah. They have a pretty good chemistry with each other. Um, I didn't like the pl- subplot of Max, like, killing his grandpa. Like, his grandpa's... <laughs> like, his grandpa, like, oh, you're an evil kid because your father was bad. And, you know, now my daughter's dead because of him. And you know, blah, 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 so fuck you. And he's like, fuck you, Grandpa. I'm going to inject you with this shit, which I don't remember what it was, if it was, like, just air or something else. <laughs> um, I either, but I just remember, like, so Max is great in the standpoint of, like, you have, like, there's not many times in movies I feel unnerved, but, like, between, like, him in the walls, between him drugging her, between him watching her get fucked by her boyfriend, between, like, masturbating in her bathtub, and, like, watching her bathe. I'm like, this is a severely, like, creepy, creepy character. But I think Jeffrey Dean Morgan plays him so well because when he's normal, he seems so normal in it. But I'm telling you, that needle inside the, like, toenail part still gives me the skeeves. Yeah, and the fact that she so quickly gets, as you said, her house, like, you know, with the surveillance cameras. And I think for me, I hate, like, just like with Into the Ashes, I hate that halfway through the movie, they're like, hang on, rewind. (laughs) Let me show you you exactly, um, you know, how this is all staged by this, like, mass stalker, you know? Um, That's so much planning. Because, like, if you were, like, going to actually do that, do you not think you'd be like, oh, hello, or, hey, somebody said, you know, but to be, like, putting up a flyer in the hopes that she would realize that, you know, oh, there's an apartment open, like, everything had to work so perfectly for it to actually happen. Like, it was too convenient. Although, I will say, I mean, stalkers are freaking insane. Like, I've seen plenty of videos where it's like they will go to those lengths. But, no, I get it where it's like everything was a little too convenient. And as you said, that final fight scene, holy shit, does it drag out. Like, nobody's business. I think we did, um, what was it, not too long ago, maybe a month ago, we did uh, movies with bad endings. And I think we put this on that as well because it's just so drawn out. And I think I said then that it didn't it seems like they just didn't know how to end it yeah oh, i agree because they just were like let's just keep it going i'm like there's nothing gonna change they were like do we have like we're gonna make this movie last up until like a certain time mark you know what we're gonna do it the fight scene oh we could add more creepiness we could add something else we could add some dialogue no 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 it's fine we'll add like a five minute fight scene which doesn't seem very long until you're realizing that like it's the same thing over and over and over and over and over again just in different scenes it feels so long 
Um, yeah, I have to see how long that movie actually is because I don't think it's like say that long. But that would be interesting if it was like we got to stretch it at least somewhat. We can't have like just an hour long movie. We got to make it at least like an hour and a half. And they're like, well, here's some more fights. <laughs> yeah, I heard you like some fights, so I put some fights on your fights. <laughs> um, I almost feel like the resident was like Hillary Swank's way of maybe trying to like it's it's funny and this sounds bad, but it was like this movie is because Jeffrey Dean Morgan has been popular for a while, but it's like the resident was like here's Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Lee Pace pretty much at like maybe the bot not the bottom but like on their way up in Hollywood, and here's Hillary Swank on her way down. <laughs> Because I feel like I haven't seen her in anything since that movie. She was in, I believe, that movie, um, oh, my God, two years ago. Do you remember that movie about where it was, like, a version of Battle Royale where, like, all these people, like, woke up in the middle of a field with, like, collars on their neck and they pretty much had to, like, fight to the death? And then it was, like... It was like canceled for horror movies, huh? She started playing in bad horror movies. That's what I'm saying. She was in this like horror movie that came out like two years ago. Um, but yeah, I think that's where her career has went. So I don't know. I agree. Max and the Resident, good character, bad movie. Um, although again, we watch it just because it's bad doesn't mean we don't watch it. Sometimes it's an enjoyable bad movie. Well, so I'm going to um, – my number five is kind of kind of be similar where I don't think, say, necessarily the movie is, like, that that bad. But when I step back, I think the only thing I really like from the movie is this one character. So I just deal with it for this one character. And so the character is Amos, played by Boyd Holbrook, and the movie is Little Accidents. Um, so – I really like Boyd Holbrook in this movie. Um, Boyd Holbrook plays a character who was a coal miner stuck in this, like, mining accident where he was the only survivor and a shit ton of other people died. And the whole thing is, like, A, people – and he, by the way, was, like, permanently injured from this. So it's him coming back from a coma and, you know, recovery to – you know, this new world where people in this town, it's like you have a bunch of different things. People are pissed kind of that he survived because he was the only one in the group that wasn't married and didn't have a family. So people are like, why you? Then you have where some people are like, well, you're going to sue the company for negligence, right? But then you have his father like, no, don't sue the company. He doesn't know really what to do. And then you have this like other plot of where, the husband so then you have the husband who owns the whole i guess mining company that everyone's say blaming for the accident because he you know maybe knew about the dangers but instead of taking care of it just sent people down there anyway and so you can tell that like him and his wife played by elizabeth banks don't have a very good relationship and then she who's like i guess has always lived from maybe like a place of privilege meets amos um and they end up having an affair with each other but it doesn't like last very long because they come from two totally different backgrounds and you know just don't understand each other and then on top of this what's happening is amos's so Amos is trying to take care of his best friend's wife and children who like his best friend died in the mining accident. So he tries to like help out with the, the widow and the son. And so then the son of the widow one day goes into the forest with Elizabeth Banks's son, the rich kid's son accidentally pushes him, but then the kid falls and like, hits his head and dies and so then the widow's kid decides to start becoming like a you know lawn mower for elizabeth banks's character all while holding out the secret that he killed her kid meanwhile they're looking for the kid it's a whole lot of convoluted shit honestly uh, in it um i don't like first of all i don't like elizabeth banks in it 
there's something that I hate when I hate when actresses get these southern roles and the only way they know how to do a southern accent is go, well, I don't know. Oh, it's the bre- very, uh, Georgia. It's the it's the Southern Bale, and it's very breathy. And I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting out of breath just doing that. <laughs> He's that kind of shit. Wait, what did you say? And the, I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. That yeah, that, that. yeah. Like, oh well, and it's like <laughs> I hate that because it's so. Southern's gonna be like I, that damn uh, that dark. I can't do it anymore. I always do it that that darn diddly darn bad thing. Like I can't remember how I say it. it there's something I do on stream where it's like this horrible like redneck like accent, and it's like if you're gonna go deep south, you better go deep south. And if you're like in a mining town, dude, you better put on that twang and not just like oh I'm Southern Belle. You're not from Georgia. You're not from Alabama. You're somewhere else. Well, it's supposed to be that, like, you know, they're really rich, right? Like, they live in the part, even though it's a mining town that most people live very poor, they live in, like, the very small neighborhood that has, like, huge houses, and they're very, you know, well-to-do, and they, you know, don't, like, understand the common folk. <laughs> so I don't I don't know. There's just a lot in it that's going on. I mean, it's an all right indie film, but when I was just breaking it down right now, I was just realizing how much shit is actually in it. I was like, holy shit, that's a lot. Um, but I like Boyd Holbrook as Amos because I think Boyd Holbrook is a good actor that people kind of like sleep on. And his performance as Amos being this, like, guy who is very insecure about everything, about now the way that he looks, about the fact that he was the, like, having an immense amount of survivor's guilt, being pretty much, like, torn between his father saying not to take legal action because, you know, you still got to stand by your employer, and then all the people who are telling him that he needs to take action because he's the only one that can prove that um, there was actual negligence and it wasn't just a little the mistake and all that. Dead. Like, this dude's, like, horribly, like, like, maimed from this accident. And you're going to be like, no, don't sue him. Don't get money. And it's like, oh, your employer. Dude, sue him, and you're going to have enough money that you can live the rest of your life without working? Well, it's it's like they were trying to perpetuate that this guy had the really old mentality of like, you know, you, you respect, you know, your employer or some shit like oh that. I'm telling you, if I got hurt in an accident and they're like, oh, but we're best friends. They're like, pay me some money. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it is at the end of the movie, Amos does decide to – um testify and say shit and that was another thing is that you know he's having an affair with the wife of the guy who owns the place and so she was pretty much also trying to be like well you know you don't want to do that because that would hurt me you know uh because i live in this and he's just like you know i'm so tired of everyone else telling me what i should or shouldn't do i'm gonna fucking do hmm Nobody, I like, I was just like, well, it would hurt me. It's like, well, I'm pretty fucking hurt. I'm pretty more hurt than I think you're going to be after this situation. Well, yeah, like, there's a scene that I do feel bad because, like, his character, you can tell, doesn't have, like, use of maybe one of his arms um, and everything now after the accident. Like, he does seem very, like, permanently maimed, as you said. And there's at some point where, like, I guess a woman that he used to sleep with, like, tries to kind of, you know, come back on to him again. And he's just like, yeah, I don't, like, have any desire after all this shit happened. Which then is funny, though, because then he starts sleeping with, like, the Elizabeth Banks' character. And it's like, maybe he just didn't want you anymore. <laughs> but, yeah, so I just think that... There was a lot in the movie that they didn't make sense. Like another thing also is the kid, you know, he having guilt, I guess, um, being now the lawnmower kid for Elizabeth Banks's character who's sitting there mourning and grieving that she can't find her son. 
and thinking like, well, he'll come back all the while this kid knows he ain't ever coming back. I pushed him really hard. His fucking head cracked open like a fucking egg on that. Mm. He did. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, I mean, the movie isn't like that bad. I think it's the same thing like with The Resident where it's like you can watch it still because but I think when it boils down, I only watch it because I like Boyd Holbrook in it. Yeah. No, um, I, I kind of feel that because that was like during your big Boyd Holbrook kick. So I can see why you'd be like, yeah, this, uh, I can, uh, just this part. So. I was thinking about that yesterday. I was like, you know, Boyd Holbrook is, is a good actor. And I really expected him to blow up more after he played Donald Pierce in Logan. And it really feels like people don't take notice of him. And I'm like, he k- kind of gave us one of the best villains in a comic book movie, but no one fucking talks about him. But we talk about yeah. Logan all the time, but no one talks about the villain. Yeah, and he was great in it. He was a I great thought, villain. I thought so. But, yeah, so that's my number five. Brittany, what's your number four? I am going to go with, uh, and you'll kind of laugh at me, and I hope I hope I don't accidentally take one from you. Are you okay um, if they start with an L? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, so go ahead. I'm going to go with Loki from uh, uh, Thor, what was it, Dark World? Dark World. <laughs> <laughs> that whole movie. It's so freaking bad. There's nothing, like, redeemable except for the fact that we have Loki dealing with the fact of, like, being imprisoned, you know, for his actions. And his father, like, you know, your birthright was, you know, basically dying. (laughs) And then it's like, so I don't even remember the full plot of this movie. I just remember watching Loki looking all sad and greasy. Did he not look super greasy in that freaking cell, though? Like his hair? A little. (laughs) A little greasy. And I'm just, like, doing and, like, you know, turning away from his mother and, like, yeah, not to my mother. And then his mom dying and him just so, like, distraught because, you know, what he said to his mom. And I don't know. Loki is always a shining point. But, yeah, we have this whole subplot of, like, oh, she got one of the uh, Infinity Stones, which we didn't know at the time it was an Infinity Stone, like, absorbed in her blood and all this other shit. And then Loki, like, yes, I have died. You know, oh, I finally redeemed myself. Just for the little fucker to be Odin right at the very end. (laughs) You know what also got me with whenever uh, he's walking and he turns into Captain America? Oh, my God. I love that, though, so badly. You have no idea. <laughs> and I know. And I know this got a shorter. It's just like, I love, like, because we've talked about Thor Dark World so many times and how bad it is. But I just thoroughly enjoy Loki's parts to the point where even in this movie where I remember nothing of the plot, nothing of what's going on except for, you know, Odin basically treating, uh, was it Jane? Is that her name? Jane, yeah. Yeah, treating her like shit and the mom dying, which I like how, uh, like, that movie is so forgettable, but it ended up in Endgame. <laughs> I know, I know. I think the whole reason why it ended up in Endgame was just for the mother scene with Thor, because you have to think that that was probably, like, just, you know, still such a beginning of Thor's, like, trauma, pretty much. Yeah, and it gets, I like how he's, like, well, on one scene, it's like you have the fact that he's seeing his mom, but also he got his old hammer back, which I also feel like did this defeat the purpose of him, like, moving on from needing his hammer, or is it more of a safety blanket? I mean, to me, like, I've seen people bring that up before, but it's like, I didn't, I didn't mind, because I think now it's like, now it's just a tool. It's not the source of his power like he thought it was before. Now it's like now he knows how to use it with his powers. That it's just like the a tool to help him with it. That's how I, I interpreted it. I guess you could see it like we have fists, right? Mm-hmm. And our fists are only useful from how strong we are with the arm, right? But if you put brass knuckles on that fist, <laughs> it's going to be a lot stronger. It's going to hurt a lot more. So I guess it's just a conduit at that point. And also, I think Thor wanted to know that he was still worthy. Because the whole thing about, you know, anyone can pick up Stormbreaker, right? 
the, the, yeah. that's not anything with Stormbreaker. But not everyone can pick up Mjolnir. So I think because he was feeling so shitty about himself, having let himself go, not having defeated Thanos and all that, him feeling that maybe he wasn't worthy anymore. So I think that that moment is such a big moment for him to realize, like, I'm still a worthy person of this. This is vibe you know, checker. What'd you say? It's a it's vibe, vibe checker. checker. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, first, pick it up, okay. yeah, and that might be a source of his confidence because if you have something to always tell you you're worthy, you feel right. me? But also, like, he lost the being able to pick up the hammer for a while there in the first movie he was ever in. Right, in the first Thor, um, that was a big thing where it was like he finally was worthy to pick up that hammer, um, which is, I always laugh in the first Thor when you see Loki walking by it, and he's like, let me just try it, let me just try and jiggle it a little, <laughs> and it's like, it's fine, no. it's fine, I was told that Captain America could pick it up, but he was pretending, and you could tell Thor was like, you motherfucker, and he's like, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> um oh Brittany. You know, yes not yesterday, the other day on Twitter I saw something where it was like, um, you know, what movie do you wish you could see again for the first time? And I'm like, I just wanna see that end scene in Endgame again for the first time. I want to see Cap pick the hammer back up for the first time, and I want to see the portal scene again for the first time. Because when I'm telling you when I saw that, I was like uh, 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 like when you see the Mjolnir like lifting you're like it, it has to be Cap it has to be Cap it has to be Cap and then it's like oh my god it's Cap <laughs> that's the perfect thing with his uh, shield too mm-hmm. and I love Thor going I knew it <laughs> I, uh, I'm i trying to think what else there was something else I was going to point out mm. uh, does he say on your left or on your right on your left. <laughs> but I was like, why does my brain want to say right? And just like, because I sat there, I was like, how's he going to do it? Because it's so intense that you forget, like, hey, yo, they did the snap. Hey, you forgot that they did this or they did that. And you're like, oh, I hope it worked. But how are they going to get there in time? And you realize Dr. Strange and his boss, he's like, dude, we got portals, bitch. We got magic. When I tell you, I like, you know, they did the snap. But then I almost, like, completely forgot because then you're just kind of, like, thrown into this, like, insane battle with Thanos. And it's, like, you know, the whole movie was without the rest of the Avengers, so you kind of got used to, like, what you were seeing in front of you. So you're, like, oh, my God, when this huge army of Thanos and there's just Cat, which, by the way, reminded me exactly of Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. For those who have watched Game of Thrones, you know what I mean. In the Battle of the Bastards, when Jon Snow is just, like, facing Ramsay's army by himself, and he just pulls out his sword just ready to fucking get. And it just reminded me of that. And it's, like, when you see Thanos' army and you just see Cap, and you're, like, and then all of a sudden you hear that, and you're, like, what the fuck is that? And it's like at first you don't register that that's Sam, and he's like on your left, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> no! Yes. I know. The whole like auditorium was like, oh no, oh yes, like and I remember, like I I remember going to see Endgame because I was waiting in line. I think I actually saw, I think I saw Endgame alone because I think Aaron was pipelining. You know, you're in New York, and I think I just sat in line and was like. Well, it's really easy to get in as the only person there, and I think they cut off the line, like, a little while after me, because there were so many people packed in, and they had, like, all of these theaters, like, were playing in-game, and I was sitting there, and the whole freaking, like, everybody, it was like everybody was suddenly in on it together, like, we're in this together. It's really what it felt like. That was such a beautiful fucking moment. Like, it was so earned, and when you slowly see, and it's, like, quiet, you know, the first portal is T'Challa and Shuri and uh, Okie. Okie, I never know how to say her name. I apologize. But they come out first and, and like, T'Challa just gives Cap that, like, nod. And you're like, oh, it's about to go down. Shit's happening right now. And everyone, and it's like, you realize you're like, everyone's back. There's Peter Parker. There's Doctor Strange. There's everyone. And, okay, I know I'm going on a tirade, but my favorite part of that is when Doctor Strange goes to Wong, he goes, is that everyone? And Wong's like, you wanted more? 
And that's when suddenly you see Ant-Man bursting out of the freaking crater with Don Cheadle in his new freaking uh, war machine suit with Rocket. And I'm like, uh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I can remember at that point, where is, uh, where is Iron Man? Um, Iron Man's in that thing, but the thing is, like, because I think he got, like, probably knocked aside and shit like that, because it looked like Thanos was, like, beating them, you know? It's like he, yeah. he pushed down Thor, he pushed down Iron Man, there was just Cap kind of standing there. Him also, like, you know, the shield was broken a little, it was, like, hand shaking, like, shit wasn't looking too good. And then suddenly it's like you just got all the other Avengers coming in. Like, And I love, first of all, by the way, not only the Avengers, but you had all of, like, the Doctor Strange people, like, all of their, like, magician guys, the sorcerers. And then you had Valkyrie coming in with all of, like, the Asgardian warriors. And I was like, this is amazing. This, this is so is. good. <laughs> and then when he finally – and Cap finally goes, Avengers – Assemble. Yeah, the the Avengers theme starts playing. I'm gonna watch that after this. You got me. I love that scene. I could watch that scene over and over and over Are you again. Saying, I could do this all day. I could do this all day. Wait, wait. One last thing. And then when you realize like shit's going down, and you're like, oh my god. And then it's like suddenly there's a force coming from the sky, and it's like. Who is it? And it's fucking Captain Marvel just coming and literally destroys the ship in one foul swoop. Straight through it. She's so OP. <laughs> straight. <laughs> although I, Please nerf. Although I will say, um, I think Wanda is the strongest Avenger. Because she almost killed Thanos. Because when she was like, she was like, uh, you took everything from me. And he's like, I don't even know you. And she's like, you will. <laughs> And just she freaking ends. I would have thought when we were watching Age of Ultron that she would be, like, so fucking intense. She's really powerful, so I know that you're not watching WandaVision, but just know she is more powerful than I think we ever thought. That Like, she's so... that What she can do with her powers is insane. Um... Just so good. And by the way, in the in the show, they have a discourse as to who's the strongest. Because freaking, um, there's a character, Monica, that gets introduced, right? And she's like, well, you know, we all know that Wanda would have, like, defeated Thanos if it weren't for, you know, him uh, setting the fire blasters on her. And, like, Jimmy Woo is like, well, you know, Captain Marvel did come in. And it's like, they have a discourse of, like, who, who's the strongest Avenger? <laughs> I think it goes to show, like, how much the world relied on them, where it's like they have these discussions where it's like, oh, everything's about the Avengers. The Avengers. She's so powerful, though. I'm sorry. After watching WandaVision, you're like, strongest avenger sorry captain marvel you're strong too you're insanely op as well but like wanda literally can create worlds <laughs> that's that's pretty insane. fucking scary <laughs> but um going back to what you said loki in the dark world that's how unmemorable uh dark world was that we don't even want to talk about it but i agree uh, just know that loki was great Loki was the best thing in that, and I agree 100%. I say that all the time. Like, I only – because people – I'll say I hate Thor the Dark World, and people are like, but you love Loki. I'm like, yeah, I obviously skip to Loki scenes, and then I just don't watch the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's fine. It's fine. I will say, um, like, the best scenes, though, in that movie are the end when, um, you know, Odin transforms into Loki – and some and I, people always point out, you know, in that scene, I don't know if you remember, when he's Odin and he tells Thor how proud he is of him. You know, these are things that Odin has never even said to Thor himself, or at least he didn't in, up until Ragnarok, you know. And yeah. it's like it's Loki who, you know, loves his brother as much as like he's a little shit. And all that. It's like he loves his brother. And I think that he was telling Thor these things really from the heart. Um, so I love that. Um, and Loki's just the best. I can't wait for the Loki show. <sighs> uh, but let's move on. Number three, keeping up with Tom Hiddleston. 
I'm going to do um, Dr. Robert Lang in High Rise. So this is Tom Hiddleston's character in this movie, High Rise. Um, High Rise is this whole thing that's supposed to take place in, like, the 1970s in the UK that is supposed to be this, like, really big building, like, sets of buildings that are supposed to be, like, all in one buildings. Like, you never have to leave them. It's, like, why leave them? They have a supermarket in them. They have all these, like, really fantastic apartments, pools, you know, uh, lounge areas, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's, like, this building where um, – the guy who like designed it lives there and he's like this really eccentric person who wanted to create essentially this like utopia in a building but things start going awry because it almost becomes it almost becomes like the titanic in a way where it's like the people on the upper floors are the wealthy ones that get everything that like it's a fucking paradise where they're all like all the couples are swinging all the time and they're all partying constantly. And then all the people on the bottom floors are the ones that are getting their like lights shut off, their water shut off and blah, blah, blah. And it's like slowly um, things start to descend in this movie where the power outages are more frequent. The supermarkets start running out of um, food and everyone starts like, turning on each other even though it's like you know you could leave the building you don't have to stay in this building but they all start like turning on each other and it just becomes this like anarchy where people are literally killing each other and throwing people off the balconies and like you know setting fires and literally start like you know there's a guy that walks around like with a freaking like television on his head and everything and it's like so weird that everyone just starts going like slowly mad in this place and it's, like, as if the owner kind of, like, planned it all along because then all of, like, the really rich people up on top, like, start, I don't know, assassination clubs. I Like, I can't even tell you really, like, what happens in this movie. I watched the it. The plot's very convoluted. The plot's crazy. It's, like, why is everyone going crazy in this building? Why aren't they just leaving the fucking building? It's, like, there's that one point, which, by the way, did kind of, like, remind me of the pandemic where they're, like, Tom Hilson's character goes to the supermarket that's, like, running out of things, and there's, like, one thing of paint, and, like, literally, it's, like, him and a bunch of people fighting over this one can of paint, and I'm like, oh, that was us with toilet paper. But again, but, but again, you could just leave the building. Like, you don't have to stay in the building. But it's, like, one of those things where it's, like, Tom Hilson's character starts slowly going mad because he's a doctor – who starts slowly, like, not showing up to work because he becomes obsessed with, like, the building life, you know, and all that. Like, why leave the building? Everything you want is here. There's no need to go anywhere else. Everything's here, you know? I don't know. It's just weird. Um, And I put Tom Hiddleston's character just because I think Tom Hiddleston is a good actor in anything that he does. So the character isn't particularly bad. Um he narrates the movie the entire time and I quite like his like narration style of it. So I didn't mind him necessarily. The movie was just the weirdest fucking thing I've ever seen. Um, I didn't understand. Apparently it's like based on a book and it's like, I get kind of the concept of it. Um, but I think that the way it was executed was just really weird. Um, I wish they could have done a better job with it. So, yeah, that's going to be my number three. There's not a whole lot to say other than I was just severely confused the entire time. No, I feel that where you're like, I love this actor. I love this character. So I'm going to watch it and I'm going to probably give them more of the benefit of the doubt that I should because it's like, oh, they're great. But then you're watching it and you're like, what am I watching? (laughs) At this point, I'm just watching him recite dialogue because I like him the best. I think uh, it was, yeah. It makes me think of there's a video game called We Happy Few and it's about like how all these people and it takes place in the uk uk has like this thing about like pretend happiness type situation because in this game everything looks is very happy and bright and everybody's grinning but the reason why is because in the society you're forced to take these drugs right 
and they're supposed to keep everybody happy and all like calm and everything is good. Well, the main character stops taking the pills, right? And suddenly you're seeing that the world is very gray and very dirty and very scary. But the thing is, there's these police that wear happy masks, like they wear masks that are like grinning, but really like they can tell that you seem different because you don't look happy and so if you take the pills it's hard because in the game you gotta like kind of like like get a balance where you have to take the pills sometimes so that people aren't suspicious of you but also to actually see the world it's supposed to be to further the plot you have to start, stop taking the pills but you have to seem normal like people will look at you and realize oh he's not happy and have to like they'll sick the police on you to force you to take the pills that reminds me of remember the show that i liked some months back brave new world Yes, 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 it, yes. That's what makes me think of that, too. In the in the show, it was like everyone's taking these, like, happy, like, pills the whole entire time. And it's like any time anyone gets a little bit, like, sad, they're like, oh, here, just take some Soma. Like, you know, you'll be good. You know, we're all happy here. And, like, that's literally the I'm obsessed with this because yeah, that's another, like, very, like, British show. Very, yeah, everyone's – you know, that's a really – and, like, honestly – I don't know. I'm not British. I would love to hear someone's, like, whole reasoning as to why that is, like, such a common thread amongst, like, British and UK, like, movie shows, video games. It's, like, why this constant, like, need to be happy, even if you're not happy and not like accepting your emotions, you know. I think their society has always been very proper, like very prim, like you know, like very because you know America's not like that because you know we didn't grow up with a monarchy, we didn't grow up like in a certain way where like you were expected to be a certain way. So maybe that's more like tied societal wise, where it kind of has to have like that air of like manners, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like it's improper to talk about your feelings yes could be i'd love someone who i i'm serious i would love someone who's like into psychology to break that down i think that would be a really cool thing to kind of talk about so yeah um by the way i'm still like mad that brave new world got canceled i thought that was really good and i know especially because people love the alpha beta kind of situations yeah, and it, it left off on a huge cliffhanger. I really like Harry Lloyd, the guy who played Bernard. Um, I think that he doesn't get enough credit for his acting. Um, I just think that other actors are picked on top of him. But I think that if he was given the chance, like, I literally, like, you know I love Tom Hiddleston as Loki, like, always. But Harry, it, it's the same thing, like, I love John Bernthal as Frank Castle. But I could also see Frank Grillo as Frank Castle. So even though Tom Hiddleston is Loki to me, Harry Lloyd would have done a pretty good job at Loki. Um, So that's my shtick there. But yeah, so um, Robert Lang in High Rise. Brittany, what's your number? Well, what's the number two for the list? What's your number one technically? (laughs) Really quick, I gotta see which movie he's from because I know the character I want, but I gotta remember what movie he was technically from. So I'll I think just continue it was, talking. Oh, uh. Days of Future Past, <laughs> X Men, Days of Future Past, because it. Wait, which character are we doing? Super. Oh, t- speaking about WandaVision. <laughs> yeah, that's what, what was funny was, so Days of Future Past isn't particularly awful, but none of the X-Men movies have particularly always been just fucking amazing, right? And right. this is like during the reboot where we have. Uh, Oh, I will say, Michael, uh, is it Fassbender or Fassbender? I always called him Fassbender, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, we have him as Magneto, and he's great. And then I can't remember the other dude's name, but... Uh, James McAvoy. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So of him playing... Uh, 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 Professor X. Xavier. <laughs> and my thing is, it's like, the movie is forgettable. Like, I'm always going to love X-Men movie because I love the thought of mutants and everything, but the movie itself is forgettable. 
my thing is, though, Quicksilver, I still remember. Because I remember telling you, I'm like, yeah, you know, we have Magneto, and the rest of us kind of just, and, you know, I don't really care much about it because there's too much going on. But Quicksilver is great because he almost is like, he's everything in the Flash should have been in Justice League. Mm. You know, the playful, I'm the trickster speedster, and I'm really fast, and I, you know, kind of fuck with things as I'm going. And it kind of gave, like, a really good point of view of what it must be like to be going at that speed consistently. And I love how there's, like, the air of, like, his uh, interactions with Magneto, where you're kind of realizing, like, oh, you fucked his mom and made him. You're actually his dad. But, you know, they never say it, at least in the movies I've seen. They may have finally, like, had that introduction between them. But you No, I heard that they haven't. They haven't? Okay. But it's like, he's good enough that you have him show up again in WandaVision. Which I'm like, if people didn't like that character, why would we be adding him to other things? Why aren't we using the other characters? Well, I'll give a slight spoiler. He may not be the Quicksilver that you think he is. <laughs> what do you mean? So, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't watched WandaVision, I'll give you a second to fuck off or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that's not Pietro. Um, he's He plays Pietro, right? He comes in and it's like Pietro, but it's fake. We all know it, right? They yeah. even acknowledge it. Like, Darcy has some... Because the whole thing is, like, this whole, like, sitcom that, like, the people on the outside on sword are watching. And Darcy literally goes, she recasted Pietro? Like, so they know it's not him. And even at some point, Wanda's like, why don't you look like who I remember you looking like? And <laughs> it's... And by the way, like, I said this on a podcast because, and I think it's in the context of the show, it's no disrespect towards Evan Peters or anything, but he was really fucking annoying in WandaVision. But I think that was his, like, thing because the real villain of the show brought him in and even calls him Pietro, fake Pietro, to try to get answers to try to get answers out of Wanda. So it's, but it is really interesting, right? So it's like you have Evan Peters, quote unquote, playing Quicksilver, you know, because it gets people really happy from the Marvel thing, but it's not really Quicksilver. It's all an illusion. Um, So it's really interesting in that sense. But as you said, I don't, I don't think Kevin Feige, the president of Marvel Studios, would have brought Evan Peters in to play this character if he didn't realize how much people loved uh, people Quicksilver. People love Quicksilver. And that. I think that's at first people were like, he's annoying. But they're like, you know what? He's fun. Well, no, people are freaking out when he came into WandaVision. They're like, oh, my God, they're merging the two worlds, which I then it was kind of the first time we had a Marvel character, uh, like a X-Men character finally in truly from that series, like from that world and going, this is a character that played a mutant, which was like off limits for so long. Well, and I think that's why people are were freaking out, which then kind of made it funny where they confirmed that that's not really pietro <laughs> hey, pietro petro pietro um no it's awesome they're definitely tapping into the mutants thing they just called Brittany. you have to watch wandavision even though i'm spoiling shit for you um they just called uh wanda scarlet witch which they weren't allowed to do beforehand oh because... shit so it's what they're doing in WandaVision is so fucking cool. Um, and again, like I found Fietro kind of annoying as shit, but it's still remarkable that they're even allowed to do it. I will say I still I still sit there going, can't we just get the Quicksilver from Age of Ultron back? <laughs> I miss him. You <laughs> I love like that actor too. I loved Aaron Taylor Johnson. I was upset. But, yeah, no, I mean, it's so funny that you put this down because people are probably going to, like, have our heads on this about because people love Days of Future Past. They love that movie. Oh, I, it just, it's like, the movie itself, because it's like, it's good, but it's not great. I just remember which I feel like, and Magneto. Which I feel is, like, the, like, whole thing about the Fox movies. And that's what I I said that on another podcast where I was like, when we were talking about WandaVision, me saying that I found like P- 
Pietro, this Pietro, really annoying. And people are like, oh, well, that's kind of how he was in Days of Future Past. And I'm like, I never saw Days of Future Past. And people are like, oh, my God. And I'm like, because, you know, my whole thing with the new X-Men movies is that none of them have really been good. I liked the original trilogy. Like, I still do, even though it has a lot of faults. Logan and Deadpool are phenomenal, but besides that, like, First Class was okay. It didn't blow me away. And, yeah, people like Days of Future Past, but people, like, say that Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix are literal fucking trash-like shit. And it's, to me, it's like Fox's X-Men, especially after First Class, was always like, it's good. It's just not great. And I just didn't have ever a desire to dip my toes into that. I just, I don't know. I just, I just want to love X-Men so bad because of, like, our childhood. But I'm, like, looking back, I'm, like, I don't know if this is rewatchable. Well, I have, when they finally, like, bring these characters, because, again, like, I, Evan Peters was playing a fake Pietro. I think that was just supposed to be, like, a nod. Um, but when they start really bringing the X-Men into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's going to be good. You know it's going to be good. Which reminds me, I still never saw that one movie I wanted to see, what, like, that was supposed to be, like, a scary X-Men movie, like a scary uh, mutant movie. Oh, New Mutants. I wanted to see that, too. I heard it wasn't really that good, which is disappointing because the trailer oh. looked really cool. I know. I waited for, like, years to be able to watch it because I was like, this is going to be great. And then everybody kind of like... <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It just seems like Fox just didn't know what to do anymore with their, like, characters at all. Um, so for me, I'm like, uh, I know people really are excited because they want, they want these X-Men from Fox people to come back. Like, they want Michael Fassbender to come back and shit. And I think that the whole Evan Peters gave people hope. But for me, I'm like, I do want them to just recast. Like, let's start fresh. You know, bring bring the characters back in, but bring in new actors, which sounds a little hypocritical considering I really want Charlie Cox and John Bernthal back, but they it's were still they're, <laughs> they were still under the Marvel universe. Like the net at one point those Netflix shows did connect to the MCU. But Fox never connected. That was their thing. So I don't know. I don't know, but um, the only person that it's okay for Fox for to come over is Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. Only thing I accept. Which I hope they do, because I can't see him they being did. played by anyone else. Okay, thank they God. The, Kevin Feige, the president of Marvel Studios, confirmed that um, they're going to make a Deadpool 3 um, with Ryan Reynolds, and it will be rated R. It'll be their only rated R movie, um, because they He's- know that they want to keep what people love so much about this character. Disney's getting intense. Disney's like, Disney's scared. They're sitting there like, oh my God, all the moms are going to be really mad at us. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) But um, I love it. Quicksilver and Days of Future Past. Brittany, you have to watch WandaVision. The the series finale is next Friday and it's getting intense. And when I tell you that this is opening up what's going to happen in the movies, it's opening up what's happening in the movies. Like it's it's insane. The precursor. It, it no like this whole um show and it's just so beautiful too. Like can I tell you really quick? Elizabeth Olsen, who plays Wanda, is such a phenomenal actor. The emotions that she like exudes while she is mourning is just so fucking intense. Like there's so much, especially in the in the recent episodes. Oh my god. She's so good. I'm sorry. Like I eh, eh, it's yeah, so good. I just sent for her really quick. I have to. But anyway, let's move on to the number one in our top ten good characters in bad movies. Of course, let's go through everything. We have number ten, Sloan in Into the Ashes. We have Michael in Brothers by Blood, Wonder Woman in Justice League, Harley Quinn in Birds of Prey. Max in The Resident, Amos and Little Accident, Loki in The Dark World, Robert Lang in High Rise, Quicksilver in Days of Future Past, and I'm going to keep up with the comic book movies, and I'm going to do Wallace Keefe in Batman vs. Superman, 
played by Scoot McNary. The, oh my gosh, yes. The most, like, way to misuse a great fucking actor. So first of all, if you're new to this channel, hi, I hate Batman versus Superman. If you're not new to this to this channel, you know how much I hate Batman versus Superman. It is an awful movie. I don't care how many new edits and cuts Zack Snyder wants to give us. It's not good, all right? First of like, Henry Cavill's good. I'll give him that. Still, he's amazing, although I'd say that I much prefer him as Geralt of Rivia than Superman. Um, what? Still you what? <laughs> I was laughing at you. I love The Witcher. <laughs> um, Went to your Witcher, Tia. Oh, my God. You're going to get that song stuck in my head. Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so Batman vs. Superman was Ben Affleck's introduction as Batman, which showed me enough to never want him to be Batman again. Um, and, you know, the whole thing is, oh, Batman doesn't like Superman because he thinks that Superman's too powerful. And when he was trying to save the world from utter destruction, um, a city got destroyed, which I know sounds really heartless, but I really hate that argument because – I'm sorry, it's the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few. It's the same thing like in Age of Ultron where everyone bitched about Sokovia. It's like Ultron was going to destroy the world. So I'm sorry, like this sounds bad, but it is what it is. Or, you know, people who are like, oh, my God, Wanda, what happened in Civil War? I mean, you know, Crossbones was going to blow himself up. She just tried to, you know, yeet him out of the way. And I'm sorry yeah. that some people died in the process, but it, it, you know what I'm saying? It's like, should we just let the bad guy destroy the whole world? Is that what yeah. what we should do? Should we just let him destroy the whole world? Or would you, you know, let the guy fucking work? So to me, I'm like, you know, it sucks what happened that some people died, but literally uh, Superman was just trying to save the world. So I, I apologize. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. All right. But anyway. So that happened. So Batman, like, has a fucking, like, hatred boner for Superman after that and decides I'm going to build a suit to, you know, fight against Superman and a lot of other fucking bullshit happens that's terrible. But you have this character in the beginning of the movie, Wallace Keith, played by Scoot McNary, who's such a phenomenal actor, who um, is a character who gets his legs destroyed by um the building collapsing from the battle between um freaking you know superman and zod right and mm-hmm. wallace wallace keith is a um employee of uh bruce wayne which also never made sense because isn't the fight between superman and zod supposed to be in metropolis so how did like I don't know that, oh i think it was like i think it was like their building that was in there, and they just so happened to be in that area when it happened, if I remember correctly, which don't hold me to that. So Bruce Wayne was just happened to be in Metropolis at that point. Okay. like Yes. Talk I about think they had, like, an outsourced, like, little, you know. Okay. Like, so, buildings. so Wallace Keefe gets his uh, legs cut off at that point. He's really resentful, and, you know, he's really resentful against Superman and all that. He gets pretty much roped in by Lex Luthor, or, I'm sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, um, to, you know, try to testify against frickin' Superman. He's given a really nice, cool frickin' wheelchair. Um, and in reality, the whole thing was so that um, when Wallace Keefe is testifying against Superman, Lex Luthor can blow the place up and shit um, with the wheelchair. Fucked up. Which is fucked up. But I thought that Scooby McNary did a really good job as Wallace Keefe. I mean, it was this really emotional character who had lost so much. You could feel how he lost so much because not only did he lose his ability to walk, it seemed, it was alluded that he may have lost a lover of his because I believe there was – or his family. I think that at some point I saw that there was a family uh, photo. So he lost his family um, and all that. So he lost a lot. And, you know, you could feel that in his character. You could feel how much he wanted to testify against Superman because of uh, all this, un, you know, unrestrained power that Superman was exuding and all that. And my main thing for putting Wallace Keefe on this 
list is not only just because, again, um, while I thought Scoot McNary did a great job in playing this character that ultimately went nowhere, my understanding is that the original um, plans for this character was for this to be his villain origin story and for him to become the villain Metallo, which I don't know if you remember Metallo, Brittany, from uh, either, I think... I loved him. I thought he was great. Great. Uh, I just like Brittany. I grew up watching Batman the anime series, Superman the anime series, Justice League, Justice League Unlimited, and Metallo is a Superman villain who I saw a lot in those cartoons and was a really fantastic villain. And there was even concept art of um, Scoot McNary's character becoming this, but then it never went in that direction. I'm like, what a misuse of such a phenomenal. Uh, actor and it would have been the perfect villain origin story you know loses his legs needs to get maybe bionics to help him out you know and then just slowly starts maybe descending into madness and fight it would have been perfect and the fact that you know Zack snyder who's everyone's god apparently you know couldn't like do that it's like are we going to get a cut of that zach <laughs> I was like, can we see something like I just, I don't know, I just think it was such a waste, especially because you know once they do that, there's never a chance that they're going to come in and be that. Like, everybody keeps sleeping on Scoot. Everyone sleeps on Scoot McNary. He's such a phenomenal actor, everything that, and he's been in a fuck ton, and he's really good in so many things, and I'm really just waiting for people to, like, wake up and get to know him. Um but it is funny, like, Scoot has been in both Marvel and DC, just not maybe in a capacity that people would remember him for. But he has dipped into both. And to me, I'm like, if DC isn't going to use him properly, I really hope that Marvel maybe brings him back, maybe as the same character or maybe as a different character. I don't see him chi I do, too. I don't know if it's going to happen. Probably not, because I feel like... Um, that little short All Hail the King is just not known by people. But so if he's not brought back in Shang-Chi, I just love for Marvel to like put him as something else because again, phenomenal actor who certainly deserves it. But yeah, so Wallace Keefe in Batman vs. Superman, good character, bad movie. Bad. Um, <laughs> Brittany, do you have any honorable mentions that you'd like to throw out there before we wrap everything up today? I think I had Rob Novak from, uh, what's it called? Sleepless. Sleepless, which the movie wasn't terrible. It just wasn't, like, super memorable, but I just remember where I loved Rob in it. Yeah, I totally agree. That was the movie that got me noticing Scoot McNary, so I can never forget it. Um, (laughs) I don't think I have any honorable mentions. I think I threw out all the ones that I wanted to, but I think this is a great list. I love it. I love Um, it, too. And if you're listening, please let us know what type of character you think is a good character that unfortunately is in a bad movie. But, Brittany, why don't you let everyone know where they can find you, what you got going on, and all that good stuff. I was going to say, you can always find me at Twitch at Itty Bitty Brit. I've been playing Vampire Bloodline The Masquerade, which always makes me want like good, a good vampire movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a fun time. Uh, we just, I, I maxed out seduction on my character, so I have been on a mission to seduce everyone I come in contact with, which is always fun. And then on Twitter, you can find me at Itty Bitty Brit Zero, which I update my schedule, pictures of cats, all that kind of good stuff. Everyone, please make sure you check that out. Brittany is a very dedicated streamer who um, spends lots of her time making sure that she gives you guys great content. As for me, you can check me out at TC underscore Stark on both Twitter and Instagram. You could also follow GeekVibesNation.com, which has links to all of our social media accounts. And please make sure that you're checking out our YouTube page, Geek Vibes Podcast. Not only do we do every Saturday the 
Marvel Cinematic Review, which right now is reviewing WandaVision, but will be reviewing Falcon Winter Soldier, Loki Show, Black Widow, Eternals, Shang-Chi, anything Marvel that comes out, we'll be reviewing every single Saturday night. I don't know if I said Friday before. I don't know why I did that, but Saturday night. Uh, And then also, I have some amazing interviews that I just did. I just interviewed Yatiti Badaki from American Gods. You can find that interview on our YouTube channel. She was just so radiant and so beautiful and amazing that you got to check it out, as well as my interview with Jesse Cove the son of Martin Cove, who plays John Kreese on Cobra Kai. That was really fun. So please make sure you check it out. we got a lot of awesome things at Geek Fives Nation, um, and we will see you next week on the Top Ten. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. There's a new family of scratch-off games from the Ohio Lottery called Taxes Paid. If you like big payouts, this is your game. The $10 Taxes Paid Scratch-Off has a top prize of half a million dollars. Prefer to keep it small and play for fun? This is your game. Taxes Paid Scratch-Off start at just $1. So pick your price, pick your prize, and play today. The Taxes Paid family of games, new from the Ohio Lottery. This is your game. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Please play responsibly.